is that Freud began as a biologist. Right. He was an extremely good biologist. He made contributions to how nerve cells function, how they communicate with each other. Uh, and he gave this up in order to devote himself to psychoanalysis for two reasons. One is he felt that biology wasn't mature enough to explain higher cognitive processes, uh, and also in order to have an independent scientific career in those days, you had to have an independent income, and he didn't have that, so he had to go into private practice. Uh, what did Freud tell us about how the human mind works, and what well, model? Well, the model that he had, as has already been described, was that there's an unconscious mind, right. and this unconscious is just filled with all kinds of nasty impulses. And if these nasty impulses came out into your conscious mind, you'd feel really bad, or if you acted them out, you'd feel even worse. And so individuals developed what was called repression. This is a whole layer to cut down on the nasty right. impulses that were there. So I wanted to do some research to determine just what these hostile, sexual, bad things were, and to try to prove that Freud was right. So I decided that I would look at depression. Now, Freud and some of the other people felt that depression was due to hostility that people experienced, but ran up against this wall of repression and then got deflected downwards. It went into the unconscious. Now, it was believed at that time that the dreams with the royal road to the right, unconscious. Right. So I thought, why not just look at the dreams and we'll be able to pick up all of this hostility and then we'll prove for the first time that Freud was right using the techniques of modern psychology right. and modern science. Unfortunately, when I studied the dreams of depressed patients and compared them with non-depressed patients, depressed patients showed less hostility. My what did that tell say, you? Well, it, it told me that either I didn't go deep enough <laughs> or, or, or the experiment was a failure. Well, okay. But it was an experiment. It was an experiment. But I did notice something very interesting, and that is that in the dreams of the depressed patients, the scenario consisted of the patient being thwarted, deprived, diseased, uh, deprecated, disparaged, and so on. In other words, the dreams... Uh, portrayed the dreamer as a loser yeah. in some type. Right. Well, when I asked the patients about the dreams, it turned out that this is the way these depressed patients saw themselves in their real life. And I thought, well, maybe I didn't get deep down into the unconscious, but I got something I could get a hold of. And so when I started to talk to these patients about all of their negative beliefs about themselves, it turned out these negative beliefs or exaggerated or totally wrong. Yeah. And what I then called cognitive therapy consisted of getting them to evaluate whether a particular interpretation of a situation was correct and to actually apply scientific principles, set up a hypothesis, I am no good, everything I do is wrong, look for the evidence, look for the counter evidence, look for specific incidents, and then do some kind of a behavioral experiment and see how it turned out. Now, what's a behavioral experiment? Now, behavioral, to give you an example, uh, there was a woman I saw many years ago, actually, who became depressed after a breakup within a relationship. And her conclusion from that were two things. One is that she was totally unlovable. And uh, secondly, that uh, she could not maintain a relationship. And therefore, she could not, since she could not live without a man, she was going to be consigned to being unhappy for the rest of her life. Uh, so first I had to look at uh, the question of being unlovable. I said, okay, what's your evidence for that? She said, well, I've had three relationships and each one broke up. And that, that proved that she was unlovable. I said, well, what's the other evidence? Are there any other people in your life? And she says, oh, yeah, I've got a lot of friends. And they all love of me. Yeah. And these other people, people do love her and so on. So anyhow, that yeah. made a little chink in that. But the big problem was her belief, I cannot live without a man. And so I asked her, I said, was there any period of your life when you were really happy? And right now you're very unhappy. She said, well, when I was in graduate school, I was really quite happy. And I said, and who was the man you were with then? She said, you know, I didn't have a man then. 
Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, that's kind of odd. If you can't live without a man, how did you survive then? So that, <laughs> that made a little change. And so then the behavioral experiment was, I said, uh, obviously what happened in her relationship is she was so anxious about being abandoned mm. that she would cling to her partners and she was always asking for reassurance. And eventually she would drive them crazy and they, they really? they'd leave. Yeah. So I said, well, you know, you've got to work through a few things. So how about if you do this experiment and let's just talk about things and don't try to start up a relationship for a period of time. And when she went for a period of time without a relationship, she was much happier. And, and then I said, well, now that you feel you don't need love, perhaps you can go out and get love. And at this point, since she wasn't so desperate about getting love, she was able to get so another relationship. Happy. And she got happy, but she wasn't desperate anymore. Now, so explain that. The, what we learned from that, what he just told me, is? Well, what he, what he discovered is the fact that people have behavior patterns that are pre-conscious or even consciously aware of that leads to their being miserable. It doesn't involve deep insights into the unconscious, just looking at the person's thought right. processes. And he realized that people are depressed have a certain kind of logic to them, and if one points out to them that this logic bears no relationship to reality, it helps them realize it and change their behavioral patterns. So both of these people have made an independent, remarkable insight that you can improve behavior without deep insight into unconscious processes by just paying attention to style of thinking and styles of behaving. And it's a radical shift in the therapeutic approach. Where is Freud less relevant today than he was 50 years ago? Less relevant. Where has he been, where do people with the accumulated uh, experience and intelligence at this table look now and say, uh, he, he was wrong here, he may not have been wrong, r right here, but is no longer relevant. I think when you as we put it in look context, at, yeah. uh, putting in context the Freudian theory as a general way of explaining all mental phenomena and including all psychopathology, all forms of um, mental illness, not simply the neuroses, but illnesses like schizophrenia or bipolar illness. It is in those areas that Freud's theory um, uh, has less relevance today as we've come to understand more of the psychobiolo psychobiological underpinnings and genetic underpinnings of certain forms of severe illness such as schizophrenia and bipolar illness and have developed therapies that are related, uh, th that are more effective. There. What is the biggest misconception about Freud, you think, in terms of common parlance? What, what do we assume about him that's wrong, not so much what he assumed that was wrong? Well, do you understand? Yes. I think yeah. one of the things that we assumed that Adam was wrong was that his style of therapy and was a non-interactive and very austere and removed. He would have been considered not Freudian at all in our current parlance. He was very active. He was very involved. He was, in, he was an investigator in that consultation room. And I think at some subsequent generations which have made a caricature of this silent, uninvolved, mm. austere analyst. Yeah. How is science, things that we can see and measure well, and calibrate? I've tried to study the kinds of things that Eric has uh, been writing about and so on, but so far we haven't been able to bridge the gap where it's actually going to change the way that I treat mm. the patients. But hopefully, as we said before, we'll be able to determine there are certain areas of the brain that become inhibited or that light up when you use a certain particular type of maneuver. Right. Right. And when we do all this neuroimaging, we'll be able to find out more. As it happens, there have been only a couple of studies where there have been neuroimages taken during psychotherapy. One of them actually um, w was using just straight cognitive therapy with um, people who were depressed. As we said before, compared to pharmacotherapy, the cognitive therapy started at the top and worked its way down, and the pharmacotherapy started subcortically and worked its way up. And there's something about that that we could learn more about, which I haven't been able to integrate as yet. One of the things I've learned from cognitive neuroscience is the importance of 
importance of representing mental states, beliefs, thoughts, feelings, mm -hmm. wishes, desires. Yeah. Neuroscience has taught us that there's a special part of the brain that actually in human beings is devoted to this capacity.